Good evening, Facebook viewers. Welcome to our Wednesday TIFF Talk. My name is Karen Gert, and I'm here with my colleague, Lynn McFadden. Tonight, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Dexter Turnquist here to discuss TIFF, GERD, and answer all of your questions. Thank you for being here, Dr. Turnquist. Thank you so much, Karen, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here to discuss this very important topic. Thank you so much. So before we get started, um, I'm going to give you a quick bio and, and let you know about Dr. Turnquist. He is a board certified general and bariatric surgeon who is the managing director of Turnquist Surgical Solutions in Houston, Texas. His bariatric program has been certified as a center of excellence for bariatric surgery by the Amer American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery and he's earned uh, recognition as a Blue Distinction Center uh, for bariatric, bariatric surgery. Uh, Dr. Turnquist is in practicing medicine, um, not just being a good doctor, but he's designing and implementing superior treatment programs that help his patients make life-altering improvements to their health. Uh, for more than two decades, he's been doing just that, earning regional and national accolades for his process. When he isn't busy helping his patients, Dr. Turnquist Turnquist is an active with numerous medical and professional groups. He has served on the boards of the Houston Academy of Medicine and the Harris County Medical Society, and he is actively involved in the Texas Medical Association, where he serves on the Trauma and EMS Committee. And in his spare time, he enjoys spending time with his wife and kids. Thank you so much for being here. Again, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, the... Um the medical society thing has gotten to be a full-time job in and of itself. Uh, yeah, I'm now the president of that society, so so just add one more thing to do. Congratulations. And viewers, tonight, please post your questions uh, in our chat for Dr. Turnquist. So um, we're going to go ahead and, and kick off our program. Uh, Dr. Turnquist, could you um, kind of let our viewers know, you know, what, what GERD is? and uh, you know, how it's treated, some of the mechanical problems, uh, typical and atypical symptoms. Sure. So gastroesophageal reflux or GERD, um, it's a disease um, or a process uh, that results from a malfunction of the valve between the esophagus and the stomach. So what ends up happening is that valve is, it becomes incompetent. It can't hold back the pressure in the abdomen or the stomach. And so fluid in the stomach acid, gastric content, refluxes up into the esophagus. As a result of that, uh, patients will start to have symptoms. The bigger problem being the changes that occur in the esophagus. Sometimes we know that we're having reflux, but sometimes we don't really even know that we're refluxing, but the damage is still occurring. <clears throat> so, so most people will describe GERD or gastroesophageal reflux as a burning sensation in the lower end of their, their chest. So it might even be substernal. It's not unusual people come in and, and actually have to be evaluated for cardiac issues. They think they're having a chest, uh, having chest pain from, from a heart attack. When it turns out really what's happening is the burning on the lower end of the esophagus from the acid causes an intense pain there, which can really mimic a heart disease uh, or heart attack. So typical symptoms, though, are, are the burning sensation may come up, may even come up into the mouth. Um, people will frequently have um, <clears throat> sometimes a sore throat that they can't really explain why I have this sore throat, but I have a sore throat all the time. Um, sometimes, uh, speaking of atypical type symptoms, people will have cough, um, getting pneumonia or lung infections. Some people, um, untreated for long periods of time, can actually end up with fibrosis scarring of the lung and really nobody knows why you have this scarring of the lung it turns out that they're aspirating particularly when they're asleep at night don't even realize that they're having these reflux episodes at night um, going into their lungs and causing inflammation in the lung but the typical symptoms again are a burning sensation in the mid chest having fluid kind of come up sometimes it doesn't come all the way to the mouth you may just feel you know, when you've had that extra Thanksgiving's coming. So when you have that that big Thanksgiving meal and you feel that, oh my goodness, but you're feeling it regularly. You're feeling it almost after every meal. Uh, typically that's representative of some reflux and a hiatal hernia, which kind of come hand in hand. So again, those are the big symptoms. But again, the other ones that are more atypical are the chest pain kind of, I don't know what this is, kind of burning sensation. 
again, coughs that uh, um, you've seen the ENT doctor, you've seen the allergist, and nobody can find what's going on here. Um, the waking up at night, feeling like I'm choking, um, earaches, worn teeth, uh, just having your teeth uh, um, worn down from the acid uh, reflux on the on the teeth. Um, so, so those are kind of the the big ones that that people will complain about. Thank you for going through those atypical symptoms because those can um, those can be scary. So when you're seeing your patients. How do you talk to them about treating their GERD or if there's any activities they can do to minimize their, their symptoms? All right. So, so GERD um, is on a, on a continuum. Um, there is minor um, burping or reflux um, episodes that are really uh, not that bad, and we can treat those with just diet modification. So if you're just having occasionally reflux, you know, after you've had uh, one too many cups of coffee or, or that barbecue, um, you know, big barbecue sandwich or whatever. That's one thing. Those are those are um, um, you know one-off uh, um, kind of episodes, and we treat those just with with antacids. If if you're having these symptoms a little more frequently, you're starting to have them with almost every meal. You can't enjoy the foods that you normally would like to enjoy. Then we may want to step up from from just a plain antacid to something like a like a um, uh, what we call a proton pump inhibitor. Um, or, or PPIs. These uh, medications have been around for a long time. <clears throat> That's your Zantac, your Prevacid, your, your Protonix, those kind of medications that actually shut off acid secretion in your stomach. Those, those can work to, to suppress symptoms. The, the downside to those medications is it really doesn't do anything about the actual reflux of gastric contents into your esophagus. That is a mechanical problem. And the only way to fix a mechanical problem is to see a mechanic to fix that fix that valve. All right. So so minor reflux, reflux not too bad. Occasionally here and there, then we would treat that medically. Like I said, we we'll start out with the antacids, and we'll move on to the um, sodium pump inhibitors, proton pump inhibitors, uh, PPIs. These are stronger medications that really shut down the acid in your stomach. Once we get past those and we're still having symptoms, and I frequently see, frequently see people on multiple medications, they're on more than one medication, or taking twice the dose that's recommended by the manufacturers. In those kind of situations, we really do need to start thinking about surgery. And surgery for reflux basically boils down to recreating the valve between the esophagus and the stomach. That valve serves as a barrier uh, between that acid in your stomach and, and your esophagus, which is not used to dealing with that acid. Again, the big problem with that acid being in your esophagus, you're going to get changes in your esophagus. Uh, you may have heard of a, a disease or process called Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus being a change in the lower end of your esophagus. And the problem with Barrett's esophagus, you're now having the lining of your stomach starts creeping up into your esophagus where it shouldn't be because it has to deal with that acid environment. But the problem when you start getting changes up there is that these changes can go unchecked. And before you know it, you're developing um, malignant changes or atypical changes there that can turn into a cancer. And so those are the big things that worry us about just treating it medically over a long period of time, particularly if you have significant um, issues with, with reflux. Because again, we're controlling the acid with the medications, but we're not controlling all the caustic agents, other agents that are in, in your gastric content coming up into that esophagus. So for a long-term treatment, particularly as a younger person, medicines really are not the right answer, in, in my opinion. I think, you know, it is a mechanical problem that needs to be fixed. The good news about fixing these valves is that once we fix it, um, or recreate that valve, we can most times get off the medications. Again, the medications masking symptoms, but there are also some, some hypothesized um, downsides to taking medications for long periods of time. Um, having uh, bone, uh, uh, leaching bone because we don't absorb calcium very well. Iron requires um, um, acid in your stomach, and so you don't absorb your iron as well. Um, minerals, magnesium, etc. cetera, all these, these things that, um, that you really require an acid environment to really um, um, take in very well. So when we start cutting down the acid in your stomach, we're causing some other effects. 
And most of us really don't like taking medications to begin with for a long period of time if we don't really have to. Fortunately, like I said, there is a solution to it, and the solution is to recreate that valve, which is um, relatively straightforward to do. Uh, we're here um, on this talk, we're going to talk about the, the transoral incisionless fixation fundoplication, which is a device, um, a procedure that we do through the mouth. Um, depending on whether you actually have a hiatal hernia associated with that or not, um, we may not even to make any, not have to make any incisions in the abdomen. We may do be able to do it all through your through your mouth. If you do have a hiatal hernia associated with your with your um, reflex, then you may need to do a combination procedure where we fix the hiatal hernia um, surgically, and then we wrap that lower end of your esophagus. And by wrap the lower end of the esophagus, what we're talking about again to recreate that valve, uh, we're going to take the top end of your esophagus. Oh, sorry, your stomach, and wrap it around the lower end of your esophagus so that we form kind of a, almost a pig in a blanket um, kind of a, a situation. And what that does is when your stomach distends, it puts a little pressure on that, on that area there in the lower end of your esophagus so that you close it, that muscle, that, which is a very weak muscle between the esophagus and the stomach, it gives it a little bit more support to stop things from going back up. Obviously, a very, very successful operation. Like I said, uh, you know, we expect the, you to be off all of your uh, medications, and we expect that to be durable long term. Well, thank you so much for, for that explanation. And, and I'd like to get more into, um, you know, what the TIF procedure is and how it, it works. But first, um, I want to ask Lynn, I think we've got some questions coming in for you already. Uh, from our Facebook viewers. So, uh, Lynn, do you have any you know questions for us? Turn quest, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are a couple questions that have come in. Um, one in particular, it's perfect timing when you were talking about the PPIs and being on medications. Um, you know, we're often asked, can you cure, can GERD cure on its own eventually? Um, but uh, Muhammad here is asking, uh, he's saying first that he, had, he was diagnosed um, with GERD after doing the pH monitoring and then um, a manometry, and it showed that his esophagus, that his esophagus and LES work just fine. Mm -hmm. um, can I get rid of GERD for good without using the medications forever? So, so typically, when once you've developed reflux, it usually will not just go away on its own. Now. That's not to say that you can't change behaviors um, and be able to control it. So you'll still have a little bit of an issue, but there are some foods that certainly are gonna cause more problems with, with the reflux. So those are your caffeines, your peppermints, your red sauces, um, like I says, barbecue, spicy, greasy things. Those things, if you can live without those, those things, then you know perhaps your your reflux can come under control if you don't have bad reflux. Like I said, it just happens occasionally. But once you get into a situation where it's occurring more frequently, then it's unlikely that it's going to resolve without some sort of intervention. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, Chad is asking. How do TIF, the TIF procedure results compare to other reflux surgery techniques? Excellent. So, so the TIF procedure has been around for, for quite a while now. And so we have data that we can, we can actually uh, compare TIF to whether the gold standard uh, anti-reflux procedure in this in front of Um And the TIF procedure absolutely holds up very well compared to the to the fund application of the gold standard operation. Um, the, we call the, the, the Nissen fund application the gold standard because it's been around a long time. We know how it works, but it is how we got to the TIF. Basically with the TIF, we are doing essentially the same operation as we would with the Nissen. Although with the Nissen procedure, it's a 360 degree wrap, which means we go all the way around the esophagus, as opposed to the TIF procedure where we go three quarters of the way around the esophagus. And that's important. It's important because 
one of the downsides and why we've kind of moved away from the Nissan fundification is because with that wrap going all the way around the esophagus, it really does shut down the esophagus such that you can't burp as well, you can't vomit as well, so you get sick and imagine you want to vomit and you can't vomit. Um, a lot of pressure in the stomach. With a TIF procedure, because it's only 270 degrees, you still have the pressure relief. So if you had to vomit, you could vomit, or if you needed to burp, you can burp. Um, and so, you know, with the fund application, if the, if, the gear, if the air can't come up, you're still swallowing air, it's gotta go somewhere, and so it's going down. And so people will complain after a fund application about excessive gas, um, perhaps flatulence. We don't have those kind of issues with the TIF procedure. But in terms of effectiveness, they're absolutely very close uh, in terms of efficacy. Uh, one of the other advantages to doing a TIF procedure is for some chance that you will get recurrence of the reflux some years later, uh, which is a possibility years later, um, you can always repeat a TIF procedure because it's not we're not destroying any of the anatomy. Everything's right where it's supposed to be. You can actually repeat that operation and again get the same results. Uh, once again. So a very repeatable, very uh, reproducible um, um, results and, and very successful. I'm excited about it because it really does um, simplify the operation and really um, we have so much less um, complaints, again, being the bloating and, and can't vomit kind of things. Um, I really do think it's um, the way to go and it's, it's really become my number one operation for reflux for that reason. That's wonderful and thanks for the explanation there. <laughs> I think you uh, just touched on Salome's question as well. Um, she's asking why did why uh, what about the TIF procedure? What were you drawn to, and why did you choose to offer that to your patients? Right. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think I covered that there. But basically, to reiterate, it is a very reproducible operation. It means we can do it the same way, expect the same results, uh, pretty much on on every patient. Um, it is um, fairly straightforward in terms of operation. Um, the risk profile is excellent. The chance of something going wrong, very, very low. And again, um, the issues with, with bloating and not being able to vomit, um, sensation of having food um, difficult to go through, those kind of things we really don't experience uh, as we would with a traditional uh, Nissen to a large extent. Very nice, thank you for that. Karen, I'll turn it back to you for now. Thank you, Lynn, and, and I love that, uh, Dr. Turnquist, uh, with, the, with regards to your saying the TIF procedure, it's reproducible and uh, mm -hmm. getting great results. Uh, right. I, I, yeah. I that. Um, so, uh, you know, what patients are, are gonna wanna know is how, or what testing, or how do they get diagnosed to see if they're a candidate for TIF? Right. Yeah. So, so there are a couple of important things that uh, we need to know uh, in order to proceed with a surgical intervention. First of all, do you really have reflux? Is the reflux significant? Again, is this something we just want to treat with lifestyle changes, uh, dietary changes, or is this something that really does need um, treatment? Um, so we're going to want to know how bad that reflux is and how we determine how bad that reflux is. We want to measure the amount of acid that your esophagus is exposed to. There are two ways of doing that. There's a traditional, what we call 24-hour pH monitoring, where we actually take a little probe and put it down through your nose into your esophagus. It's a very small little noodle that sits there for about 24 hours, and we measure how much acid happens in that 24 hour as you go about your daily life. Well, a lot of people are not very comfortable with having that little, little probe, even though it's really not that bad. But for people who really don't want to tolerate that, we've moved on to something called a Bravo test. And a Bravo test, basically, it's a little capsule that we will put into the lower end of your esophagus. That little capsule transmits uh, to a little um, beeper-like device, a um, little cell phone-like device that you carry with you. The advantages being that you can actually record when you're starting to have symptoms. What were you doing when you had these symptoms? And we can really correlate very nicely the amount of acid in your, your esophagus versus, uh, and, and your symptoms. And so, so we really have moved mainly to doing a, a Bravo in terms of testing for acid exposure uh, in the esophagus. With all of our patients, we'll want to do an upper endoscopy. 
um, because again, there are all sorts of reasons to have discomfort and really to have this burning. And we want to make sure we don't have anything else going on. If you've had acid reflux for a long period of time, as I spoke about spoke about earlier, you can have damage to the lower end of your esophagus, and we want to know that. Uh, we need to test to make sure nothing's changing there in a bad way. Um, so everyone will undergo an endoscopy procedure where we'll go in, make sure that things look okay. We expect to see some esophagitis. There's some irritation of the lower esophagus, but we also want to make sure that nothing bad's going on there. There's bad esophagus or something more significant. And then we'll put the the, the pH probe, um, which the little the little um, capsule there uh, that attaches again to the lower end of your esophagus uh, at the same time. So we kill two birds with one stone there. Once we get those studies, then we determine how significant this reflux is. If the reflux is significant, then we will want to do one more test, uh, typically call a manometry study. A manometry study, what that does is measures how well your esophagus actually pumps. Um, so again, there are some, some uh, disease processes out there that where your esophagus just really stops working. And that's a different situation. We really do need to know that. Um, so there are people with autoimmune type diseases that will that that's fairly common with, and you will have reflux type symptoms, but the treatment for that is a lot different than your typical person with a um, uh, ineffective uh, malfunctioning lower esophageal sphincter, a little muscle between the esophagus and the and the uh, stomach. So we we do the manometry study, and again that basically boils down to we measure the amount of pressure and how things peristalts. Uh, with a little transducer that's put down through your nose into your esophagus again, and they just measure that. It really, that study only lasts a few minutes uh, as you swallow a few times and they take that out. So really not too big a deal. So those are, those are really the big studies that we'll want to have. Sometimes we may want to do an upper GI um, study, which is basically a contrast study where you drink um, uh, barium uh, contrast material and then we'll take some x-rays and take a look to see how things go through and how big that it, if you have a hiatal hernia, how big that hiatal hernia is, which may change how we do what we do. Once we've got those studies, then we have a good basis to to make some recommendations. <clears throat> and I know you mentioned um, hiatal hernias at mm -hmm. Um right. Could you kind of touch on uh, you know what that procedure looks like, and is the recovery any any different uh, from a um, we call a C tip versus just a straight tip procedure? So if you have a hiatal hernia that's larger than about two centimeters or so, and usually your physician will measure that the size of that, that hiatal hernia when we do the endoscopy, so we kind of know what we're dealing with when we get to discussing. But if you have a hiatal hernia larger than about two centimeters or so, then we're going to want to fix that hiatal hernia. Um, so fixing the hiatal hernia um, is a really straightforward thing. Um, basically, um, it, we will, what a hiatal hernia is, it's a defect in your diaphragm. Uh, your esophagus comes through your diaphragm, and your your diaphragm should be nice and tight around your esophagus. Well, for various reasons, that opening can open up. And when it opens up, now it's allowing your esophagus to slide up into your chest. Well, the little muscle again between your esophagus and your stomach is a fairly weak muscle, and the pressure in your abdomen is a lot higher than the pressure in your chest. So when that little muscle gets up into your chest, exposed to that lower pressure area, it can't hold back that stomach pressure, and so you're going to reflux. So we want to make sure that we get that little valve back down into your abdomen where it's supposed to be. Um, so we will go in, we uh, pull your stomach back down into your abdomen, we close that defect off. So again, it's back nice and tight around the esophagus. We'll do that laparoscopically through little holes. You'll usually have about three little poke holes, maybe four uh, little poke holes. We'll do it through there. It takes about 30, 45 minutes, depending on the size of that hiatal hernia. Um, and then uh, we'll go ahead and do the, the, the TIF procedure. Most people will go home the same day, even if they have to have the hiatal hernia repair uh, done. Uh, so really, it's not a very painful, not certainly not a, um, a particularly dangerous operation or anything like that. The risk profile is very, very low. Uh, again, safe enough that we'll send people home the same day. Um, that's good to know. And, and once they go home, um, I know that they do have to uh, adhere to a special diet. Could you touch mm -hmm. on what that diet looks like, that TIF diet. Right. Yeah, so, so we want people to be on a diet that's not going to cause them to stretch the stomach too much uh, in, the, in the initial period. So part of the way a TIF works is that we're going to put some little fasteners or sutures, if you will, to hold 
that wrap around the lower end of the esophagus, again, augmenting that muscle between the, the esophagus and the stomach. Um, so that those little tacks or sutures um, are holding it there, but what we actually want to have happen is for it to scar there so that it, it won't move. And so what we don't want to do is distend the stomach too much that we either pull the tacks through or, um, or that, um, again, it, it won't fasten, that it won't stick where we want it to be. So the first uh, two weeks after the TIF procedure, we will want you to be on a liquidy, kind of a soft diet. Uh, we don't want you to overdo it. Um, as in terms of what kind of liquids you can have, it doesn't much matter. You can have whatever you want, uh, just as long as we're not overdoing it, which is probably the more important thing. So typically, I will have the patients do a liquid diet for a week, and then I'll have to do some pureed kind of things, just being careful again not to overdo it uh, during those two weeks. After that, you're back to your normal self. Excellent. And um, looks yeah. like we do have a bunch of questions coming in. So let's go back to Lynn. Lynn, um, can you um, give Dr. Turnquist the questions from the audience? Yeah, we have some great ones that are coming in, Doctor. Um, some comments and some questions. Um, <clears throat> Mohammed said thank you for answering his question. Sandra is also expressing that um, she's had a, hi uh, a hiatal hernia. She's had, a, had it for a number of years. She's taken medications for a number of years. She doesn't eat anything after after 8 p.m. and she goes to bed and she has very bad reflux and often has to get up to um, remove the food from her mouth at, while she's sleeping. She's asking if there's anything she can do to help without getting a surgical intervention. All right, so so Sandra was, in, that's, Sandra, you're, you're really into a difficult situation here and I think you're taking some risks that you probably ought not take. Um, it's not uh, it's not unusual for us to see patients like Sandra. Uh, they've been taking these PPIs or proton pump inhibitors and acids for a long period of time. And like I said, with escalating doses, way above uh, the the, um, the prescribing dose, in order to try to control these symptoms to avoid surgery. Well, as I understand that nobody wants to be operated on, the facts are that we're going to solve the problem relatively quickly, relatively very safely, uh, um, and have her on to a better quality of life than she's currently experiencing. Because what she's, what she's describing really, again, suits a lot of patients that we see. They're fairly miserable. I mean, the idea of having to wake up at night to clear my throat. Um, how are you resting? You're not resting very well. And so, and so we can solve a lot of those issues. Imagine Sandra having a full night's sleep without coughing and choking. I think the risk of the risk of surgery really boils down to something way less than about a half a percent, less than half a percent versus taking medications. Maybe you're not burning as much, but you have things coming up in your mouth at nighttime. You have a hiatal hernia. That is a mechanical problem. You have to fix that problem. There's no way around it. I, I think, you know, like I, I think we uh, I spoke about earlier that these medications, even though they are safe, we're not sure about the long-term effects of these medications. There is some question about that. So these medications were never intended for long-term use. It's become that uh, as time's gone by. But if you go back to the original studies of these medications, they were really never intended for long-term use. Again, acid in your stomach is a natural thing. We need to have acid there for a number of reasons. When we start to alter that, we're altering some other things. Um, and so I really don't recommend, in my opinion, I don't recommend long-term use of antacids. I think that's a poor way of treating this problem. I strongly recommend, Sandra, consider doing surgery. Um, again, I understand the fear of surgery, but unless there's a reason uh, that surgery is prohibited for her, I think her quality of life will go up tremendously having this valve fixed. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Sandra, thank you for your question, sharing that uh, with, the, with the audience. Um, we have... Haley's asking, what do your patients say to you um, when you see them after having a TIF procedure? Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> you know, they're, Simple they're, as that, huh? 
There are a few procedures that we do where the effect or the um, the result is so dramatic. Um, you know, again, if you, you, you just imagine Sandra's story again, you know, Sandra, um, even though she's learned to adapt to this, um, Sandra is hostage to her reflux. The Sandra wants to go out with her friends at eight o'clock at night and have the late meal you're not supposed to have anyway, but <laughs> has a late meal. And God help her, Sandra has something, has red sauce or has a, uh, some coffee after, after dinner. She's going to be miserable all night long. So when I can fix that in a matter of an hour, these operations take about an hour, hour and a half at most, and her life goes back to normal. No medication, not getting up at night. I can go out with my friends and do whatever I want to do, eat what I want to eat, not think about that. Yeah, they, what we hear from our patients is, I wish I'd have done it sooner. Um, but um, again, the, after surgery, to, I mean, to, patients um, in general, it's not a very painful operation. Um, and so it's not one of those, oh my goodness, kind of things. Uh, people return to work usually three days to a week after the operation. Um, again, they're back to eating their regular diets after two weeks. Um, the incisions are very small, so it's not a very noticeable thing. It's not like you have a big incision or anything. It's very small poke holes. Those holes are about, if, assuming that we have a hiatal hernia, that is, uh, they're about a half a centimeter or so. Again, if we don't have a hiatal hernia, you have no incisions. Um, and those folks are definitely back to their normal things in 24, 48 hours. Um, there's not a lot of sore. Sometimes you can have a little uh, sore throat, um, but that lasts a few days and, and that'll go away. Other than that, really, there is no there is no complaints per se. It's so great to hear. Thank you for that. Um, we we hear it a lot ourselves on many of these talks where patients are just very happy. Um, yeah, to, think, to a man, they're happy. <laughs> yeah, very, very, I, I really haven't heard anybody come back and say, gosh, wish I had to done that. No, it's quite the opposite. That's excellent. Karen, we do have a few more, but I know you have a couple of other questions you wanted to get to with uh, Dr. Trinquist, so I'll turn it back to you for a sec. Excellent, thank you. And and I, I, I love what you just said about don't be a hostage to your symptoms because yeah. I think so many people are, and yeah. there is a there is a solution out there that, that can you. help you, and, and you sure. really touch on it. I, I do see um, a question that I think um, would you could answer very well, is can you um, have the TIF procedure and perform a bariatric surgery at the same time? So, so the answer is technically yes, we can. Um, so depending on what your, your what degree of overweight that you have will determine what we might want to do in that situation. So a TIF might very well uh, be a great option if you have, again, minor symptoms. Um, but depending on what the situation will determine what we'll want to do. If you have significant bad reflux um, and you're overweight, then we might want to consider doing something like a gastric bypass procedure. Um, that would solve both those problems um, as opposed to doing something like a TIF. But it really just kind of depends on what your situation is. Um, I, I, you know, it's, but the short answer is that, yes, we can do a TIF procedure and do weight loss surgery. It really, again, depends on what the situation is. Excellent. And, and I know we're kind of, we're getting to the, the top of the hour and, um, We'll get with Lynn. Lynn, do we have just any last questions before we start wrapping um, wrapping it for this evening? Um, just a couple, a couple more that um, I, you might have touched on these. Can I have a TIF procedure if I've been diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus? You know, you yes, touched you on Barrett. Yes, you can. Um, there are some treatments for Barrett's esophagus, for Barrett's esophagus, um, and you, we might look into actually treating that Barrett's and trying to eradicate that Barrett's uh, at the same time or, or at a different time. Uh, but certainly you can have um, a TIF procedure with Barrett's. It, that, that's not uh, exclusive. Excellent. Thank you. And then if a TIF redo is needed, is it possible to redo the TIF multiple times in all ages without risks like with surgery? A surgery. That's again from uh, Muhammad. Absolutely. 
Yes, we can we can most certainly redo a TIF procedure, and you can do it multiple times. That's that's true. There's really no limit to that, um, unless there's something else going on. But there's really there's no limit to, to how many times you can actually redo it. But our goal, of course, is to do it one time and be done with it. Right. Um, so so and and that's been our experience. Is really we do it one time and we're done with it. But but uh, yeah, you can most certainly redo the TIF procedure without difficulty. Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, Haley is saying you mentioned earlier that, that the Nissan was good was the gold standard because it's been around so long. Do you believe TIF will become the gold standard one day? Well, okay. well, I, I I suppose that's debatable, right? I mean, you can make that argument, um, but you know, gold standards. You know, again, this is a kind of a technical term, gold standard, um, in that we want to have something that's actually absolutely reproducible that we have a long history with that we can use to measure other things against. So if we're using that that kind of definition, then certainly you can see TIF becoming a gold standard operation uh, because again, it is reproducible. We, we know what to expect from it. So I think we can make that argument. I think in medical circles, you'll have a hard time getting people to, to do that because we know historically what the missing was like um, so, you know, as, as time goes by, yeah, it, it's certainly possible as people start to forget what a, what a NISN was because uh, um, NISN fund applications are being done more or, or more and more infrequently. Um, so it will become the new norm, uh, this, this procedure. Yeah, uh, one, of the, one of the options, right? Correct. Correct. And uh, you're getting a lot of thank yous on the thread as well. So thanking right. you for sharing your, your it's, um, it's my, expertise. It's my pleasure. You know, I I, um, I certainly get a little bit frustrated um, seeing the patients who've been suffering for so long uh, with this, again, curable disease process uh, being treated by medications, scoped, um, you know, repeatedly looking at their, their reflux and damaged esophagus until it gets so bad that you just can't do anything else other than have surgery. My recommendation is to not wait so long. Um, you know, talk to your docs about it. You know, is there a better option than taking medications for the rest of my life, particularly in younger people? Uh, if you think about someone at age 30, 35, 40 with reflux, you're talking about taking medication for 40, 50 years. Do you really want to be doing that? Well, if you're anything like me, you really don't like taking medications. Surgery is safe. I highly recommend you push your doctors a little bit. Can we do something about this? There are certainly docs who are reluctant um, to recommend surgery, kind of like Sandra, uh, we talked about a little while, talked to you a little while ago, reluctant to have surgery because there's the myths out there that this is somehow a um, a tough operation to get over or carries um, you know excess risk. But as I've stated. It really is a fairly benign operation, and the risk profile is absolutely fantastic. Um, so there's no reason to uh, suffer with reflux for long periods of time. So I, 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 I would recommend you all be your own advocate, um, not accept, you know, medication. This is all I can do. Go to the doctor with information. Hopefully we've given you a little bit that you can use, and just ask them to send you to see somebody uh, to help me out with the situation such that uh, we can get rid of this, again, mechanical problem. Wonderful. Thank you, doctor. And uh, definitely hitting on point, being your own advocate. We, we stress that Absolutely. a lot on these shows. So thank you. Absolutely. Back to you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Turnquist. I was going to ask you, do you have any, you know, last parting words for our viewers or any tips for success? But I think you really just uh, summed yeah. it up there, especially with be your own advocate. Absolutely. Be yeah, absolutely. I can't, I can't stress it enough. Stress it enough. Um, it doesn't have to be this way. Um, you don't have to wake up in the middle of the night. You don't have to avoid the barbecue. Um, you know, you don't have to think about that etouffee that you might want to eat. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know that, that that commercial where the um, for the one of the antacids where the food comes back and fights them. Mm -hmm. I think about that one all the time. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. So 
So be your own advocate. Uh, really uh, inform, you know, get the information. Hopefully, like I said, we're giving you some information you can use, but certainly you can wiz- visit the websites and, and there's more information there. Take those with you when you go to see your physician and ask them, well, why exactly are we treating this? Why aren't we solving this problem? So those, those are mine. That, that is a wrap. And we really, really appreciate you joining us. Um, how can our viewers find you and schedule an appointment? Schedule an appointment. Right. So we, uh, you may <laughs> certainly visit my website. Um, it's dturnquist.com. Um, you can you can go on there, dturnquist.com, T-U-R-N-Q-E-S-T.com. Um, and uh, you can certainly make your appointment from there. You can certainly give our office a call. My office, uh, in, it's in Houston, um, in the north part of Houston, 281-444-8090, 281-444-8090. Give us a call, and uh, we'll be more than happy to help you out. Thank you so much. And um, again, Dr. Turnquist is in uh, Houston, Texas, and his practice is Turnquist uh, Surgical Solutions. If you are located outside the Houston area, please visit our physician locator at girdhelp.com. Thank you so much again, Dr. Kernquist and Lynn. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, next week starts GERD Awareness Week. It's Thanksgiving week, it's GERD Awareness Week. So uh, <laughs> tune in next Tuesday for our special GERD Awareness Week uh, tip talk. And uh, have a great evening and we will see you all soon. Thank you all.